Any question from last day? Any concern? Are you good? Yeah, if you're taking notes, it's just the is a final value for K. Is that's the correct value. All right, with that, let's uh, keep continuing. And then we solve another example. You saw a, like a beam, which we model it as, as a spring, right? So in general, um, when we deal with single degree of freedom system as an approximation, we can model, let's say continuous system like a beam with just one spring. And Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, like modeling of this simple uh, elastic structure. Okay, so today we're gonna to deviate a little bit from vibrations, talk a little bit about MEC360 and uh, uh, MEC2 dynamics part, just as a review, and Friday we come back to vibration. So um, let's say if I have a cantilever beam, like the simplest possible case. If I have a cantilever beam and let's say this cantilever beam has a mass at its tip over here. Let's say mass N. Elastic cantilever beam, and it has a mass as its tip, right? So this beam, we learn in MEC360 that because of this force, it's gonna deflect, right? Let's say these produce like a force, F, which we know it is mg, and as a result, it's gonna deflect. So let's say the deflection, I'm just gonna exaggerate here. Let's say something like, that. So the amount of deflection, let's show it by maybe delta. Right. So this delta is the beam deflection. So this delta in MAC360, we learn it has a formula. And if you forget, that's okay. We don't need uh, like how to calculate it. We just need to use the formula or you can just look it up from the table, which Delta has a formula like F L3, 3 L. Huh? So that's the deflection for, for this beam. And L is the length of this beam. So that's L. Okay, so that's the deflection of this beam. Now, I can say if I have like a linear spring and this linear spring let's say have the stiffness of K equal to 3i over l q or l power 3. So I can say these two systems are approximately equal in terms of like a string modeling. So this is force f. Because I can write for both f is k delta static, and this is delta static, right? The deflection of this beam. So we can then replace our original model, like the beam, with a simple cantilever, with a, a simple spring and mass system. So this is the mass M, and this is the stiffness K, which is equal 3 EI over L3. To refresh your memory, 
E is modulus of elasticity, right? Depends on the material. If it is a steel, aluminum, copper, or whatever, this E is a value which we can look it up from tables for that material. I, I is the area moment of inertia. So E then is modulus of elasticity. And I, area moment of inertia. Which most of the, uh, like the uh, cross section that we will deal with, either they are like a rectangular cross section or circular cross section. It might be a circular cross section, a hollow circular cross section, or a rigid, uh, like a solid one, like no hollow. So this is then the cross sections. of the beam. So probably you remember from again MEC 360 or your MEC 2 or one of your previous courses, let's say if it is B and this is H, then simply the area moment of inertia about the axis that the beam is bending, we can use I as like one over 12 B H three. And let's say if it is like a, the cross section is circular, other radius is R, inner radius is small r, then I simply for this one, about the axis that is bending, I is equal to pi over four, R four minus the capital R four, small r. This is all we need. And if it is a like solid um, circular cross section, it means the inner radius is zero and just simply put a small r equal to zero. So, and this is a very simple model of the cantilever beam replacing it with a single degree of freedom. Later, toward the end of the course, we will learn how we can model this beam as a continuous uh, structure. However, even with this single uh, degree of freedom, we can get a very good uh, result for the first natural frequency. Because later, we will learn a system that has more degree of freedom, they have more natural frequency. So for now, I can, if I have the material, so I have the modulus of elasticity, I have the length, and I have the cross section, so I can replace it with just a spring. With similar concept, I can replace a beam, which is on a simple support. Let's say it is on a simple support, like a pin at the right side and uh, just a roller or a pin on the left. And let's say if I have the mass again in the middle, so this length to be half of L and this one to be half of L and this is the mass. So again, we can look up the table for beam deflection and figure out that this beam is gonna deflect in the middle and we can find the value, let's call it delta. And this delta has a formula like FL348 E on. So that's the deflection of this beam. So I can then simply replace this beam Let's move it. so I can replace it by a spring
and mass stay as it is. So this is the mass and the stiffness K will be equal to 48 Pi over L3. Okay, so if we saw a simple beam like that, we can, in this course, we can substitute it with just a spring. Uh, and what is the stiffness? 48 E, which is modulus of elasticity given by the question. And even in practice, we use this a lot. When we deal with a beam, a cantilever beam or a structure, we can simply substitute it by a, by a spring and get a rough, uh, let's say, approximation of the, uh, the natural frequency of, or the model of the system. And if the beam is a fixed beam on both sides, which happen a lot again in vibration, uh, we have a structures um, that we can model them as a fixed beam. Later, you will see examples like that, which we have like a beam like that. And in the middle, there is a motor or something that's rotating and we want to model the vibration of that thing. So for now, we assume it is just a mass but later you will see this mass is gonna be replaced by uh, most of the cases, a motor or something that vibrates. So again, if you calculate the uh, deflection for this beam, if you look up the tables, then simply we can substitute this system by a mass and a spring system. Anyone remembers the deflection for this beam? These three are one of like the, the most common beams and the deflection probably we use them a lot. Anyone remembers the deflection for this beam? No? Okay, so it is 192 Pi over L3. So as you can see, just this number is changing, right? It is three, this one is 48, and this one is 192. So if the stiffness is going up, it means the natural frequency, remember the formula for natural frequency, a square root of K over M. The higher the stiffness, it means the higher the natural frequency, right? So it means like the last one has a higher natural frequency than the first one, which later again, when we solve problems for force vibration. Uh, let's say you have a system, you decide to put it on a cantilever beam or on a fixed beam, then you can decide on the natural frequency of the system or the design that you have to do. Okay, so, and I believe you should be all good in terms of calculating area moment of inertia. If you forget, you can review one of, one of your old textbook. But for this course, this is the two uh, most important cross section that we will deal with. And simply we can calculate their area moment of inertia using this form. Remember we have two, like this terminology, moment of inertia is being used for two cases. One is area moment of inertia, and another later we'll talk about it is mass moment of inertia, right? This is area, cross section of the beam, how it bent, so we can calculate area moment of inertia using this formula. And this is all geometry, okay? Any question for this model? Seems simple, right? You see a beam, we can replace it with a spring. You can, let's say, if you have a beam that maybe the mass is not at the center, it's somewhere else. So the formula is available on table. You just need to look up the deflection of beam, find the deflection and then simply replace it using this uh, concept of F is equal to K delta static and just find the K. Yes, please. So on internet, on Google, just uh, beam deflection you will see the tables available. If you have a textbook for like Dear Johnson or Wiley, those at the end of those textbooks, the uh, beam deflections are available. But nowadays I, I saw most of these are available on internet. Whenever you need one, you just Google it. 
So another model that we may need to do is when let's say we have a bar and this bar is under stretch or compression. Again, from uh, mechanics of material, we learn that these things are gonna stretch or compress, right? And we can calculate the amount of their deflection. Let's say if I have maybe a bar, a slender bar, or maybe just a cable. And at the end of it, there is a mass. M. And these things, either it is a cable or a slender bar, right? Which again, it happens a lot in, in calculations. For example, in uh, let's say Lionsgate Bridge, if you pass over it, you will see a lot of very big cables, very thick cables, like the bridge is hanging from those as support. And one of, later we will see one of uh, like important analysis of bridges is vibration. Uh, on YouTube, you can Google uh, bridge vibration, bridges that collapse because of vibration. And you will see a lot that happen and they are like interesting. So anyway, each of the, those cables can be replaced by a spring for us to do the vibration analysis. How we will do that? Again, we rely on, on knowledge in uh, mechanics of material. Uh, if you remember when we have, let's say uh, a bar and that bar is under the tension, let's say F, there's gonna be a deflection in this beam, right? Oh, sorry, in this uh, bar. So delta can be calculated using FL AE, correct? It's simple formula that probably you've learned in MEC2 or MEC260. So with this knowledge, then simply I can replace this guy with like a spring. Uh, this is the mass, stay as it is. And K, if I want these things to like turn out correctly, because remember, this is our formula. F is K delta, right? So then K has to be AE over L. A is the cross section, right? Area of cross section. Area cross section area. and the cross section of cable usually is circle, but it can be anything. And lastly, what if you have, let's say, something that it is under torsion? Now I have to rely on my drawing skills. That's bad. Okay, and that's that one. And this is this one. Okay, so I hope picture makes sense yeah not bad so imagine we have like a rigid disc this is a rigid disc rigid disc and this rigid disc is being attached to a flexible shaft flexible shaft 
right? It's been welded to the, at the center of this uh, disc, and the whole thing is being fixed to the wall. So that's the system. And for some reason, this system is under twist. Let's say twist T. Under twist T. So again, from mechanics of material, we learned that if you have a shaft and this shaft is under twist, it's going to twist, right? And we know how to calculate the angle of twist. Who remember the formula? Remember, it was like something we show it by phi or pi. And the formula was, you have a shaft, it's under twist. No, don't remember. It was something like T L G J. Right, which L is the length of this shaft. This is L. G is shear module of elasticity, which again from table we can read it. So this is shear modulus of elasticity. And J, who remember J? Is the polar moment of inertia, right? Which for a circle, that's the one that we are gonna deal with a lot and we need most. Let me draw the circle. And again, we consider a general case. Let's assume that the shaft is hollow, but if it's not, just we put the inner radius equal to zero. So let's say this is R. And the other guy also is R. So R and R. So J had this formula, pi over two, R four minus R four. If the cross section happened to be like a uh, rectangular cross section, then this J I will give you in the example for future if you need it, which is rare, nobody make a shaft like a rectangular shaft, but again, J for polar moment of inertia is available on uh, like an internet which you, but this is the one that you need for this course. So this is, again, the amount that this uh, is gonna twist, right? So this is the twisting angle that we calculated or angle of twist, angle of twist. Now I can replace the whole things with a spring. But the type of this spring is different. It is a torsional spring, right? The previous one was a linear spring, with axial load. This one is a torsional spring. So the model that I will have, let me draw a line here. Model that I have will be, so I have the disc, let me draw the disc. No, black one. So this is the disc. And this disc, we assume it's gonna have like being pinned to the wall. So it can rotate freely. Right. So, so far for the disc. We attach the disc to the wall, but using a pin, using a joint, so it can spin forever, freely, no problem. But there is something that resists this torsion. That thing was that shaft, right? Which now we can simply replace it by 
like a torsional spring. And the way that we show torsional spring typically is like that. And in order not to confuse it with linear, linear spring, we show it by KT and KT is GJ over L. Remember the angle of twist was TLGJ, like similar to what we did here. We say F is equal to K delta. Here we will use the same concept. We say that T is equal to KT C. Because this time instead of a linear deflection, we have an angle of twist, right? And don't forget this phi or phi, it is always in radian, not in degree, right? Again, if you remember from your MAC 360 or MAC 2, this angle of twist has to be in radian. Anyway, for us, when we see something under twist, we can replace it by a torsional spring. And this torsional spring has the stiffness of KT, which if we know the material, if we know the length and the cross section, then we can substitute it with that. And the original disc, whatever property it has, stay as it is. So this is the, like the disc. The disc is not gonna change, okay? So these two, are like equivalent of each other for us in vibration when we want to analyze them. Yes. The linear spring? So the torsional spring, it's also possible, that's a good question, that these also stretch out, right? But depends on if we have load on this system. For this simple problem, we assume that we have just uh, a torsion, right? Also, if you look from the side, this system can deflect as well, right? Because it's more like a cantilever beam. But let's say for this problem, because we're talking about single degree of freedom, we assume that it is only on their twist. And somehow, let's say we um, have some constraints, so it's not going to deflect or stretch out. But if it is stretch out, then uh, uh, that's not going to be a single degree of freedom because it is a torsional spring plus a stretch spring. So two things at the same time. So the length will be given for us, right? This is from the wall. This, that's the length of the shaft, right? That's the length of the shaft. But you're right, this, the whole structure, if you look at the whole structure, this is structure, if I apply, let's say, an, uh, a load, like an axial load like that, it's going to also stretch, right? Or because the disc has a weight, it's going to deflect. So we can say, in fact, this system can be a combination of three springs, which we will get to that, but when we get to the N degree of freedom system. For now, one degree of freedom system, we assume that this is only on the twisting, and this is how we replace. Any other question? All right. So this is for modeling. Again, to, su to summarize, if you have beams, either cantilever, simple, or fixed beam, you replace it with stiffness. You know how to calculate the stiffness. If it is a cable or a slender bar, and it is under axial load, uh, we can replace it by a spring using the formula AE over L and for twisting as you saw. Another modeling that we may deal with it a lot, if you don't guys taking notes and you don't have room, I guess at the very end of the, uh, this uh, notebook, there are extra pages. Now I learn I need, uh, I should have put extra pages there. So sometimes we have to deal with uh, linear, with uh, series or parallel springs. So let's me put the title here, series and parallel springs. Let's say I have 
one screen and another screen right after that, and so on. So this is K1, this is K2, and so on. And this one, let's say on one side, we have the wall, and on the other side, we apply load F. In another scenario, let's say, I have the screen to be parallel. And I apply the load here. So this is K1 and this is K2, and we can have many, as many as we want. So what is the characteristics of uh, uh, like parallel or like series springs? So let's start with the series one. The series one, if you assume that they are more like all of them, they are more like a cable. If I apply an, a load F, this load F is gonna be the same for all of them. So it, they have all same load. So under same load. And this one, when I apply the load, their characteristic is they are gonna all deflect the same amount. So same deflection. And the formula that we use, which you are not gonna go through the proof, it's in your previous courses somewhere. So for the first one, one over K total is equal to one over K one plus one over K two plus how many we have. And if the springs are parallel, like same deflection, this is same load, then K total is equal to sum of them, K plus K1, K2, and so on. Very simple. Uh, it's more like uh, the um, adding of the capacitors or transistors, right? You recall from one of your previous, I guess, mechatronic courses. If not, probably you've seen it. So if the springs are parallel, parallel for us, it means they have the same deflection, right? If they are in series, it means they have the same force. Like here, the first picture is force F. It's gonna be an axial load. And for all of them, the internal uh, load is gonna be F. So this is the way that we add them up. Sometimes in the problems, it's not obvious that if they are parallel or series, you need to rely on these two facts. If they have the same force, or if they have the same deflection. So I'll give you an example and you need to tell me if they are parallel or series. So how can I make more room here? Example here. Let me also put this guy. Somewhere. Okay. One example, let's say um,
let's say I have a beam, a cantilever beam, and at the end of this cantilever beam, I have another spring, and then here I have a mass N. So let's say we find the stiffness for the beam, it is K1, and for this spring is K2. And the same scenario now, let's have it like this. Let's say this is the spring. K2. And then I have, let's say the weight somehow attached at the bottom. So this is mass M. So a little bit messy here, but I guess you got that here. Okay, so we have these two uh, springs. Spend a minute and think about it, uh, if they are series or parallel. And if you remember, for us, a cantilever beam is more like a spring, which we know how to calculate the, its a stiffness. Let's say we did, and they are K1. So let's start with the first one and try to figure out if uh, these two springs are series or parallel. So the first one, series or parallel? Why? Because they have the same force, right? And that's correct. If I apply load here or because of the weight uh, mg, so we know the this force is the same on the other side of this uh, spring. And we're talking about the static deflection. So the same forces will be on the, on the point that the spring is attached to the beam. If this is F, this one also will be F. So they have the same force and it's obvious that they are series. So, and simply the uh, result for us is will be a spring and the mass M. If this is stiffness using the formula for series, it's going to be K1, K2, K1 over K2. If these two K1 and K2 are equal, then the result is going to be half of K, right? If we use this, that formula. What about the second one? Are this series or parallel? Uh, why? Same deflection, right? And you're right. If if I apply load, which here like is this weight mg, right? So this load is going to deflect the beam by a delta, and the same deflection will go to the k2. So these two springs they are parallel. Uh, and as a result, their stiffness is sum of their stiffness. 
So K for this system is K1 plus K2. So if these two systems, let's say K1 and K2, they are equal, which of them has a higher natural frequency? Remember natural frequency, the formula was square root of K over M, right? So the mass are the same for these two systems. So whenever a system has a higher stiffness, it means it has a higher natural frequency. So between these two, which one has a higher stiffness? The parallel. So sometimes in systems, a matter of changing the um, orientation of elements can change the stiffness, it can change the natural frequency, and uh, later we will see natural frequency can have a significant effect on the dynamics or vibration behavior of the system. Okay, so this is about, again, uh, modeling how we try to simplify everything to a spring and mass. If they are parallel or series, this is how we deal with them. And if they are an elastic structure, right, like a beam or a shaft on the twist, this is how we model it. Let's move on to the next topic. So, so far it was all on mechanics of material, uh, something that again, uh, familiar for most of you. Another thing that we need before delving into vibration is uh, dynamics, dynamics of rigid bodies. And I assume that most of you had like Mech 2 or Manu 265, uh, the machine dynamics or dynamics, and you are familiar with the dynamics of rigid bodies. We're just going to do a quick review uh, so you know the, you know the formula. But if you forget, don't worry, because when we solve problem, uh, we're gonna review all of them over and over again. This is just to establish a common ground. And when we refer to something, you know what it is. So first of all, we have particles and rigid bodies. Particles, it doesn't have any size. And rigid bodies, it has dimension. So then the rotation matters. And it does, it's independent of the size. Sometimes we may analyze, let's say, dynamic of an airplane and we consider it as a particle because we are, let's say, analyzing its motion from flying from one country to another country. So we can assume it is a particle. But sometimes I may analyze like this mouse and then I wanted it to treat it as a rigid body because I like to know its moment of inertia and many other things. So it again depends on the problem and how we want to analyze. If it is a particle, we learn that uh, for a particle, the Newton law tells us that some of all the forces that we apply to that particle is equal, gives this particle an acceleration, which they have this formula. Some of all the forces is equal to ma. So that's for a part for a particle. Now, instead of a particle, if I have like a rigid body, then this rigid body is going to both, it's going to have both acceleration, move in one direction, and also rotation, right? This mouse or any particle, it has also rotation. So for that, we have to use the Euler law. And the Euler law, first law and second law, it says sum of the force is equal to m a bar. The only difference is here, when we refer to acceleration, we refer to acceleration of the center of gravity. Because when a particle is moving, each point on it may have a different acceleration if it rotates. And the second law says sum of all the moment for this rigid body, because of these forces, is equal to I alpha. And I here refers to mass moment of inertia.
And alpha here is the angular acceleration, right? A is the linear acceleration. And so A here is the linear acceleration and alpha is the angular acceleration. So these are the Euler's law and which we will use them a lot and you will see them in example how we can use these things. There is a special case and that's a case when this rigid body is being fixed to one point, like to the ground and it's rotating around that point, like point O, right? The first one is free, it can move and rotate. It's a special case, it can only rotate. And again, from dynamics, you learn either it rotates like with this uh, angular velocity omega. So this omega is not natural frequency. It is the angular velocity. Angular velocity. And this alpha is the angular acceleration. Right? angular velocity and angular acceleration. So because of this angular velocity and angular acceleration, again, you learned that there should be a, like a normal acceleration. A n and a tangent acceleration, which R bar here refers to O g. So distance between O g we call it R bar, which I believe most of you are familiar with this normal and tangent acceleration, okay? For this special case, the Euler second law changed to some of the force, some of the moment about point O is equal to I O alpha. So by the way, the previous one, the moment was about point G. Please edit this one. So the second law of Euler, sum of the moment about point G is equal to I alpha. So we take the moment about center of gravity, but if we have a fixed point, we can take the moment about any other points. Uh, sorry, about the point that is being fixed, point O. And instead of I bar, which is the case for the top one. So this one, please correct it. This is I bar. And I bar is the moment of inertia about center of gravity. Here we can use I O. And it can be very handy in many problems in dynamics and in vibrations because uh, most of mechanism are rotating about a fixed point. Okay. So we'll continue uh, on Friday. Uh, please spend a little bit of time uh, on mass moment of inertia. Uh, I'm just going to quickly review that, but spend five or 10 minutes. Uh, again, on Google, you can find it. In this course, we need to know mass moment of inertia for simple geometries like a bar, for a cube, like a book, or for a disk. Okay, so try to find the formula for mass moment of inertia for this one. I will review them on Friday. Have a good day, guys.